Any questions about last session? My question was about this L2 loss that we're using with hands. Okay. Um, I know in general, like in other optimization scenarios, we use L2 loss often to like relax a problem and then make the um, optimization process simpler. Is that really the only objective here or is it, is it leading to um, like different quality solutions? Uh, so we went through the math last session and we saw that if you do the least squares loss, you're gonna get another measure of the distance between two distributions. I guess uh, I guess it was here. Yeah. You're gonna get Pearson chi squared divergence. Okay. So I would say this makes as much sense as the gener the original generative adversarial neural networks objective function. Yeah. Okay, because that's giving you a divergence. It's chance and channel divergence. This is another divergence. To me, they make equal sense. And uh, all you want from your discriminator is to separate your data. One of them is doing it using probabilities. And the other one is doing it using a function that is trying to output three numbers, A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're getting rid of the uh, sigmoid function, maybe that is causing some trouble. It's causing these uh, mode collapse problems. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so last session we stopped. Actually, we covered this paper, and we are we are going back and forth between unconditional GANs and GANs because I don't want to I don't want the class to become boring. If you go if you do all the time unconditional, then you are not going to see applications. You're just going to see some methodology, some changes in the loss function without knowing what the applications are. So let's still go back and forth. Now we are going to do unconditional Wasserish trying GAN. We covered most of it last session. So I'm going to go through that really quick. So classically, if you want to learn the underlying distribution of some data, and, you're, if, and if you're a classical statistician, what you would do is you would put a parametric family of densities. So you're gonna say, I'm gonna work with normal distributions, or I'm gonna work with exponential family of distributions, et cetera, and they're gonna be parametrized. Now, because you know the functional form of your distribution, you're gonna have a likelihood. So you're gonna know the form of P of theta, for instance, it is normal, and therefore you can write down your likelihood and maximize it. But then this is limited because you're gonna be able to work with only simple distributions. But the distribution on your images, on your text, on your speech could be complicated. It could be high dimensional. So maybe it's time to go beyond that framework. But there is a good observation here as well. Even maximum likelihood estimation is gonna give you some divergence. It's gonna give you some distance between two distributions, between the real and the distribution that you want to learn, okay? P of R, only the nature knows. P of theta, you parameterize it and then you're minimizing the KL divergence. But again, working with the KL divergence is hard. So you're working with maximum likelihood, okay? For GANs, we said there is this simple observation that if you sample from a simple distribution and you push those observations through a complex function, parameterized by a neural network, then you're gonna be able to generate samples from a complicated distribution. What did you lose? You lost the likelihood. Now you cannot use the likelihood anymore. If you want to use it, it's okay. You're gonna be able to use it, but then you're gonna do variational, you're gonna have to do variational inference and go back to variational autoencoders. So, and that's gonna be approximation, okay? So how about working directly with divergences? We know that the likelihood is doing some, is minimizing some distance. What if you play around with the distance or your divergence between real and fake? And remember, now you don't know the functional form of P of theta anymore. We can just generate samples from it. And let's say your X is the space of images. It could be the space of text. It could be the space of speech. That could be your X. You can define some set of subsets of X. And then the first measure that's gonna to come to your mind is total variation distance. And that's just saying that take elements 
of this set, which are going to be subsets of your X. So these are going to be subsets of your images and see how probable they are under the real distribution and under the generator distribution and just subtract the two ones. Look at the absolute value and pick the supremum over all of the, over all such sets. That's going to give you a distance. The KL divergence, which is going to give you the likelihood is going to, this is its distribution. This is its definition. You can use that. You can use Jensen Shannon divergence. And this was the original GANs. And remember, all of these are not computable. For instance, the Jensen Shannon divergence, because you don't know P of G, you cannot use it in its original form. That's why you were introducing some auxiliary function, the discriminator, to help you write down your loss function. Okay, you cannot work with this directly because you don't know P of G. You cannot work with KL divergence directly because you don't know P of G, etc. In a similar fashion, you can write down the earth mover distance and maybe that's a better distance. And we are gonna see empirically and the paper goes through some math, which I'm not gonna go through here, trying to justify why earth mover distance is a good distance. But the idea here is that you're gonna treat your distributions as pile of dirt. So you have one pile of dirt here, you have another pile of dirt over there in some other place. And the earth mover distance is gonna tell you what is the minimum cost of moving pile R to pile G. And what is the cost here? It's gonna depend on the distance traveling and it's gonna depend on the mass, on the probability mass that you're moving from one distribution to the other distribution. And then as I mentioned, these are this set pi is the set of all joint distributions. So a joint distribution is going to be a function of x and y. And now if you take the if you marginalize out y, it should give you p of r. And if you marginalize out x, it should give you p of g. So it's all of such distributions. So I gave you this definition. This is the definition of earth mover distance to give you the intuition of what it is doing. But then this is not practical the same way that Jensen channel divergence is not practical. And this is impractical for two reasons. One is that you don't know what is your P of G. You don't know its functional form. And the other one is that this is a huge set. And then trying to model those distributions is going to be hard. Okay. So this set, you cannot uh, model it that easily. But uh, the good news is that some smart people wrote down a theorem to make our lives much simpler. And what does the theorem say? It says that equivalently, you can compute the Wasser-Strine distance using this formula. What, it, what is it saying? Rather than working with all the joint distributions, just go ahead and work with all of the Lipschitz uh, functions. So all of the functions that are Lipschitz continuous with a Lipschitz constant of one. Just go ahead and work with that. So rather than working with that, you're gonna work with here. The infimum is gonna turn into a supremum. And now uh, you can see that you had a similar behavior when you were doing the original GAN. Over there, you had a classifier here. Now here F could be your critic. And now this is gonna be your objective. You're gonna sample from the real distribution, push them through a function. It doesn't have to be a probability function. It doesn't have to give you as output probabilities. It's just a function. And uh, that's for real samples. And that's for the generated samples. These are samples that are being generated by the generator. So the generator is gonna go inside here. It turns out that it's a good idea whenever you see a function, to approximate it with a neural network. So we are gonna approximate F by a neural network. So it's gonna be parameterized and you're maximizing this because you have a supremum there. But there is a catch. If you use the family of neural networks here, it's very hard to enforce the Lipschitz continuity. So we are gonna work in a couple of other future papers on how to satisfy the Lipschitz continuity. But this paper had a heuristic for doing that. It says that if you clamp your weights to a fixed box, then you're gonna manage to 
at least make your f Lipschitz continuous with some constant. It's not going to be one, it's going to be some constant, which doesn't really matter. So if you clamp your weights to a fixed box, it means that you are doing, uh, if your weight during training is exiting that box, you're going to force it to be inside that box. You're going to cut it. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, perfect. It turns out that this, uh, this definition or this equality and the way that you are using Wasserstein distance actually belongs to a bigger family. It belongs to the family of integral probability metrics, IPMs. Why is that? The integral probability metrics are of this form, are exactly the form that you have up there, but then you have a different family here. It doesn't have to be the Lipschitz continuous. It could be any other family. So now we are going to work with that. We are going to work with, the, with this definition of the Wasserstein distance. Why is it helpful? You can work with DC GAN. And now the cool thing is that during training, you have an objective function that is going down, which is great. You're going to see the performance of your method. And then you can see that the image quality at different locations during training is getting better and better. So this Washer-Strain uh, estimate is highly correlated with the quality of the images that you're gonna see. This is unlike the original objective function. So for the original objective function, these are just gonna go up and down, up and down during training. And you're not gonna know, are you making progress? Are you not making progress? What is happening? So you have to wait until the end of the training and see how good their generated images are, okay? So it's very hard to interpret those results. What else? Why, at least intuitively, there is a heavy math in the paper that I don't want to go through, but uh, what is the, at least the intuition of why things are working? Let's say you have a one-dimensional distribution for your generated examples. So this is your real density, actually. So these are your real examples, and these are the generated examples generated by the generator. So let's say this is what is happening. And these two distributions are far apart from each other. What does it mean? It means that if you have a classifier, it's going to associate a probability of one to this part of the domain, and it's going to associate a probability of zero to that part of the domain, because these are fake, these are real, and you have a very good discriminator. Now what's going to happen? This is just a constant. The derivative of a constant is zero. It means that your generator is not going to get updated. Okay? You're, you're never going to see its parameters, or they're going to be very close to zero. So your gradients are vanishing. What happens with this new objective function? This is uh, the function f that you have here. That one was the function d, the discriminator. This is the critic. And you can see that you're going to have gradients all the time. And once you have gradients, you're going to be able to update the parameters of your generator. You're going to see those parameters. They are not going to vanish. Their gradients are not going to vanish. OK, is everything clear? I have, I think, a couple questions. Um, so in this case, FW, like we're replacing our discriminator with this critic, which is F sub W? Exactly, yes. And what is this family uh, script W? So that one, it could be any family, maybe the family of differentiable functions, maybe the family of continuous functions, okay? A particular form is the family of Lipschitz continuous functions. And you model that family as a neural network? And you model that family, the members of that family as a neural network, parameterized by Omega in this case, okay? Okay, yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Okay, any other questions? So this, this graph of the, um, the almost linear F is just the realization of one such neural network. It's giving us that linear function, or it's not quite linear, but pseudo-linear. Yes. So during training, this is the type of networks that you're going to see. That you're going to learn. So about. this is a realization of F okay. for a particular parameter. Yes. Okay. But then for most of them, you're going to have a similar shape. And then it means that there is learning going on. Yeah. Okay. It's not like here that it's zero or it's a constant. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Perfect. So we saw a couple of examples for distances. One is KL divergence. One is total variation. 
the other one was Jensen Shannon divergence. And for uh, and we also saw pairs on chi squared distance when you were doing least squares GAN. And this is another one. There was a Wasserstein GAN. 